everyone for coming back for uh, the second part of today's session. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, photography and in particular movement in the photographic archive of OGS Crawford. Uh, here he is here with his camera. Um, I'm going to talk about a series of 124 photographs that were taken over the course of five days in July 1939 during the Sutton Hill <laughs> excavation. Crawford was a prolific photographer taking approximately 10,000 photographs between 1931 and his death in 1957. The collection uh, of these photographs is now held in the Oxford Institute of Archaeology, and uh, the collection is entirely uncatalogued. It's in varying states of disorder. It's been described as disarray, um, being scarred by history by Crawford's biographer, Kizzy Hauser. And moving through the archive today, you encounter a really, frankly, quite bewildering array of subjects. Um, so you've got seaside snaps in France, um, you've got photographs of graffiti on the streets of Berlin, uh, rock formations in Sudan, uh, portraits of famous megalithic ruins, and uh, most importantly, lots and lots of photographs of cats. Um, so unusually for Crawford's archive, the 124 photographs of Sutton Hoo are not only all contained within a single box, and the things in the box match the label on the box, that literally never happens. Um, they're actually arranged in chronological order. And it's in response to this unusual chronological arrangement that my argument really develops today. So Bora has propounded the idea that archaeological photography pairs, and this is a quote, uh, the technology of picturing absence with the science of uh, deciphering absence. He also argues that the archaeological photograph is inhabited by a consciousness of loss. And this treatment of archaeological photo photography disembodies and erases archaeologists. It dislocates them from the work of archaeology. And it also isolates photography from discussions of life and movement. And so my task in this paper is to reconnect these threads and sketch out some of the many ways in which Crawford's photographs might be said to reveal presence rather than absence, a movement rather than stillness. Christina Riggs has recently argued that photography, while being itself one of the working processes of archaeology, very rarely appears depicted in front of the camera. But I would argue that if presence and motion, um, and the presence and motion of the photographer cannot be found in archaeological photographs, this is more a reflection of strategies of looking at photographs, the questions that are brought to them, and the ways in which photographs are manipulated within institutional and archival contexts than any inherent absence in the photographs themselves. So I'm going to propose a strategy for revealing presence and motion in archaeological photography, and Kirsty touched on this a bit this morning. Um, the idea is that photographs are the material tracements, uh, traces of the movements of the photographer. Um, Elizabeth Edwards has raised a particularly valid criticism of uh, theoretical works on archaeological photography, and she says that uh, we have a tendency to focus on the kind of the spectacular, uh, the individual kind of uh, awe-inspiring images, um, and this impression is very much like being told to focus on a single point in a connected dots puzzle. Uh, taken alone, a single point might well seem disconnected from the flow of life and movement. Individual photographs examined in isolation might seem to encapsulate themes of absence and stillness. But in shifting our attention to the spatial, the temporal and the sequential relationships between photographs, uh, the wider patterns and flows of motion can emerge. Hopefully you can all tell this is supposed to be a camera. I did this on my phone last night after a couple of points. It might not be obvious. Um, I digress. So, um, in working with Crawford's photographs of Sutton Hoo, uh, I created my own join the dots puzzle. So what you can see here is the approximate location in which Crawford would have stood to take each of the 124 photographs across the five days. Um, what I found particularly interesting was to compare this spread of vantage points uh, with those used by Crawford's fellow photographer, Maurice Cookson. Um, though in a letter to H.G. Wells, Crawford styled himself as the official photographer of the excavation, he was far from the only uh, photographer at the site. Um, so Crookson arrived on the 24th of July and took a series of four photographs I'm going to show you now. Um, so we're going from uh, this way, this way, this way, maybe this one. Um, so Cookson uh, perambulated, uh, starting at the northwest corner, 
and he goes clockwise all the way around to the southeast corner. And there's almost a military degree of precision in his movements. Um, he takes photographs at quite measured intervals, um, and he's quite systematically trying to describe the whole scope of the burial chamber. Um, in photography for archaeologists, Cookson argued that the archaeological photographer should arrive on site before work begins, and then make several photographs of the entire site before excavation starts, and then document every subsequent stage until the excavation is completed. Um, this book of Cookson's has often been described as setting out a form of visual grammar for archaeological photography. And uh, Jennifer Baird, who's sitting in the room, embarrassingly enough, um, <laughs> has just demonstrated that archaeological ph photographers actively um, sought to create images and adopt practices like cleaning sites to meet these visual standards. But I think texts like this also seem to prescribe a way of moving around archaeological sites in this very careful and considered manner. And so it's fascinating to compare these first few photographs of Cookson's with the site with the first photograph that Crawford takes. In reflecting on the excavation uh, in an article for Crawford's Journal Antiquity, W.F. Grimes, who was also present at the dig, wrote that the great dish was the dominant feature in my first view of the ship, beneath which was the promise of more treasure to come. Crawford too was to reminisce that lifting the dish was one of the great moments of the excavation, and he said none of us who are present will ever forget it. So perhaps it's not surprising that this dish visually dominates the first photograph that Crawford takes. But after taking this photograph of the Anastasius dish, Crawford doesn't linger. Uh, from his stand at the north side of the trench, uh, he moves really quickly to the southwest corner of the burial chamber, where he photographs uh, what's left, or what's currently exposed, of uh, the bronze bowls. And from there, he moves again instantly to take three photographs of the whetstone, which is already safely stored in a packing crate. So the taking of these first six photographs, which we can work out based on timings written not only on the prints themselves, but in Crawford's negative register, um, took just 15 minutes, so we're talking about just over two minutes per photograph. And this is startlingly fast as a pace for such technically competent photographs. And the temporal, as well as the sequential relationships between the photographs, therefore require some consideration. This combination tells a very human story, and I think it's one of very palpable excitement. Crawford is literally dashing from site to site to see everything that's been exposed at this moment in time. And I think it's really interesting that he um, photographs as he does so, because he could have quite easily gone around, toured the site, seen what had been discovered, and then come back to take more considered photographs. So I think the fact that he's integrating photography into this process tells us something about the way in which photography is a really integral way for Crawford to experience and be in the world, to move around it. And this act of photographing is nothing like the sombre, mournful act that Bora describes, but something that's vital energetic and infused with motion. I want to move on now to problematise another of Bora's statements. Bora writes that when working with a camera, the photographer's human presence and the artist's tendency to subjectivity is held in check by the mechanical apparatus. Along similar lines, Tim Ingold has argued that photography is antithetical to participation. But both of these, these statements present archaeological photography as removed from the flow of life and movement. But photography is inherently participatory in nature. Though Crawford may only rarely appear in front of the camera in box two, it is vital to remember that he was pre present and participating in the social conditions of the site. So Crawford's enmeshment in the social landscape of Sutton Hoo is notable both in the content and his labelling of the prints. Um, just three of the 124 photographs that Crawford took have as their sole subject excavators with whom Crawford would have been unfamiliar. Um, in contrast, um, persons like Grimes, Stuart and Peggy Piggott, and Charles Phillips appear a total of 58 times. In labelling his prints, Crawford only names those excavators who he's, who he's personally familiar with, um, so those local excavators like uh, Fuller, Spooner, and uh, Basil Brown, you can see here in the flat pack. Um, they're not really ever labelled. Um, Crawford is not the only photographer on site to allow his personal relationships with fellow excavators to affect his photographic and archival practices. In two photo albums held by the British Museum, Basil Brown frequently labels Spooner, Jacobs and Fuller, uh, but Crawford and Grimes are not mentioned at all. 
Um, in fact, the only non-local excavator labelled by Brown is uh, Charles Phillips, because they do the two men do develop quite an enduring relationship after the dig. Um, these labelling practices simultaneously describe and define the social divisions that existed at Sutton Hoo, explicitly situating Crawford in a very particular social network and affecting his depiction of his archaeological colleagues. Cookson prescribed that when posing for an archaeological photograph, one must never look directly at the camera and should always stand in a working pose. And Wheeler too has emphasised that human figures must never take up too much of an image as they are just so many feet of bone and muscle. But the people that feature in box two are far from fleshy measuring sticks. For example, uh, this is print 263 in uh, the Crawford Archive. Uh, so here we've got Grimes. He's not only lounging on the floor, but uh, gazing almost quite insolently into the camera. He's giving Crawford a bit of a cheeky grin there. Um, or we've got uh, print 232, in which Phillips and Grimes mirror each other's pose. And it's this real, rather unflattering view as they awkwardly straddle the raised complex underneath the Anastasia's dish. And uh, this is my personal favourite. Uh, so in this one, uh, Crawford is labelled Charles Phillips's uh, rear elevation. Uh, he's quite mean to Phillips throughout his archive. Uh, this doesn't, it's not the only time he does that. Um, nor does Crawford depict archaeological labour alone. In uh, 251, the focus of Crawford's photograph is the action taking place outside the burial chamber. The seated figures, though not in the chamber themselves, are still seated in the outline of the ship, in a sandy platform near the stern. And this is clearly something of a social hub, uh, providing both an access point into the chamber, uh, but also a space where those present can gather when they're not working. And Crawford's photographs of both labour and leisure suggest that the camera plays an active role in mediating uh, and cementing social relationships, quite contrary to Bora and Ingold's claims. Um, so the presence of the camera seems to have stimulated social exchanges in literally every photograph of Crawford that I found in the excavation. People are constantly around him, they're watching him, they're talking with him. You know, they're really interested in the process of um, photography. And uh, here he is making tea with Peggy Piggott. Um, <laughs> and you can sort of see this crush of people kind of intruding in the form of disembodied arms or shadows that fall across uh, the foreground of prints. Um, and this is a very social thing. You know, people are comfortable in each other's physical space. And these prints speak of much messier entanglements of uh, realities of movement and life at an excavation site. And these are vital, engaging visions of archaeology. They're humorous as much as being used for solemn, studious purposes. So at the beginning of this paper, I argued that if archaeological photographs seem to be photographs of absence rather than presence and stillness rather than movement, this is often due to the ways such photographs are worked with rather than an inherent feature of the photographs themselves. So hopefully by now I've convinced you that um, there are strategies that can be utilised to reveal the life and motion and presence in Crawford's photographs. And I've also explained that these methodologies arose out of the material form of box two of Crawford's archive. But what if I had instead worked with another archive in a different material form? Would I have been able to find the same traces of presence? Normally this would be a hypothetical question, but the inherent reproducibility of photographs complicates matters. As Elizabeth Edwards has argued, from a single parent negative, a whole family tree of reproductions can grow and spread, their various material forms vastly altering their meaning and interpretation. After returning from the excavation in 1939, Crawford made two identical sets of prints, right down to the labelling. He sent one set to Phillips, and from Phillips, this second set of prints passed to the British Museum, where they can be found today in the Department of Britain, Europe and Free History. Looking at Crawford's set of prints in the British Museum is overwhelmingly an experience of cognitive dissonance. They both are and aren't the photographs that I'm familiar with from the Institute of Archaeology's archive. As physical objects, these prints are wildly different, and this has radical implications for their interpretation. Gone are Crawford's personalised annotations that tell a human story of the excavation. In their place are notations relating to features that identify the relationship between uh, plans of the burial chamber and the layout of the ship. So, for example, in this print, um, sorry, the labels are a bit faint here, I realise, but um, there's a couple of lines and they're basically just labelling various um, points of interest that help them map the plans. Whereas in Crawford's personal archive, uh, he's noted that Grimes has been peeved at someone. So there's this big shift in, uh, you know, sort of this insight into Crawford's friend's emotions, um, this, the agency of Grimes in acting and removing the standard, uh, versus this... Grimes is kind of a background feature, he's not really the point of interest. And at other times, Grimes' presence is quite literally cut out of the photographs. 
Um, so even though there is a little uh, note at the top that notes that this is a detail, the larger print, the parent print, doesn't feature at all in the archive. Um, though the dirt encrusted hands hint at a more human tale of archaeological labour, uh, it's not a personal one, and it bears no real relation to Grimes' personal account, which he published in Antiquity, of spending the whole afternoon and evening of the 26th of July racing under a hot, drying sun, frantically trying to extract objects before the sun baked them. And this is not a problem confined to prints of Crawford's photographs. Even Crawford's negatives have been the subject of much confusion in the British Museum archive. Uh, most of Crawford's negatives have been relabeled with the British Museum's own internal labelling system. Um, and in doing so, Crawford's own negative numbers are effectively removed, um, erasing the serial and temporal connections between them. Uh, on such, this causes quite a lot of confusion. So in this case, someone's written on the back of this print of the whetstone. Uh, you know, it's lifted on the 23rd of July, but Crawford doesn't arrive until the 25th. So someone's just like, what's going on? Um, and there seems to be general confusion in the British Museum over the dating of all of Crawford's photographs. In 1975, Bruce Mitford wrote that Crawford took 64 photographs of the excavation and was there for three days. A quick glance at either Crawford's prints or his negative register can dispel this motion. Um, so the British Museum's archival practices have represented efforts to prune the haptic and effective to leave only the evidential. But ironically, this forensic examination, with its fo focus on photographs in isolation, has actually resulted in the loss of information. These practices do, I think, go a long way towards shaping the kind of questions that have in the past been asked of these photographs and may actually act to obscure presence and movement. So where does this leave us? Throughout this presentation, I've been advocating for what Chris Morton has termed a whole archive approach. This is one that argues that the connections between photographs are just as important as the prints themselves. One that does not take Crawford's archive in isolation, but sets it firmly in the context of a wider network of photographic activity at Sutton Hoo. Moving forward, it will be necessary to excavate in more detail the wider connections between photographic collections and between the people who produce these collections in order to understand Crawford's photographs. So just to end on a final thought, um, the questions that we bring to the archive will change the way that we move through it. To reintroduce a consideration of life and movement into photographic archives, um, I've tried some more playful and experimental uh, roles. And this is, again, to reflect the kind of playfulness that's inherent in Crawford's photographs themselves. One of the strategies I've started pursuing is making GIFs of Crawford's photographs, using technology to animate the sequences of images of individual finds. The jerky repositioning that takes place in the transition between each frame goes a long way, I think, towards foregrounding the movements Crawford himself would have made to transition between each photograph. Crawford's photographs, then, as a linked series, form something akin to a breadcrumb trail, tracing out the lines of movement along which Crawford lived his life. Thank you. <laughs>